10 months. It's also been doing at Marshall Clinic. And again, it may turn out to be a total bust. Uh, what, what keeps us honest is we will do MRI scans before and after, mix them up, and see if a radiologist, Dr. Field, can tell a difference uh, on therapy. One thing I should say, and I didn't, is that this, this study is uh, still open, uh, uh, as is Dr. Field's study about CCSVI. Sometimes the entry criteria are quite tricky. You've got to have certain people of the right age, et cetera, et cetera. In our study, we, we were to make it uh, as neutral as possible. We're just taking people newly diagnosed uh, and not on treatment. Dr. Field will be looking at all kinds of people with multiple sclerosis. And I, time is quite limited here, but after the meeting, any of the researchers would want to talk to any of you, and I know uh, Dr. Duncan, Dr. Field would be happy to tell you about their studies. So I just want to conclude by talking about the three people that have been inspirational to me anyway. One is Vaclav Havel, who was president of Czechoslovakia. He said something about hope, which I've used in talking to my patients quite a lot, and I think makes a lot of sense. He said, hope is a state of the mind, not of the world. But this is a way of looking at hope, anyway. Hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. So how does this apply to multiple sclerosis research? Well, we should support multiple sclerosis research because it makes sense. That's the thing to do. It isn't really true to say that we support multiple sclerosis research because we absolutely know that we'll have a cure in two months. We don't know that. And if you act at this, if you knew that, that would be false hope. I just want to point out that uh, pessimism, pessimism can, can be false as well. We do not know that there won't be a cure in the near future. Uh, but the point is, um, we have to know that it makes sense. We have to support the research. I come back to the CCSVI controversy. There are people with very strong feelings. This is absolute craziness. It's not going to work at all. It's the absolute cure for multiple sclerosis. No one knows the answer to that. We have to do the study. That's why Dr. Fields is going to do the definitive study. Um, we do need a treatment as soon as possible. Uh, my chairman at uh, USC, Les Weiner, used to say, we have the cure for multiple sclerosis tomorrow. That's not soon enough. So we need it today, obviously. Uh, but this is the best way to go about it. Another thing to remember, as it's often said, sometimes the darkest hour is just before the dawn. Another person who's inspirational to me, and I'm sure to yourselves too, is Sylvia Lari. Uh, she was the founders of the uh, Multiple Sclerosis Society, shown there with her brother uh, Bernard. In the late 1940s, there was no MS Society, there was really very little being done for people with multiple sclerosis. And she single handedly almost put this together. And also, this led to the uh, International MS Foundation uh, Federation being made. As Colleen pointed out, since 1946, uh, there has been over $600 million for research. Again, she trumped me there. 721 is the number. And uh, uh, roughly $50 million a year uh, given for research for over 440 projects. One thing that's important to see there is that the MS Society funds a wide diversity of pro uh, uh, projects in all kinds of different fields, virology, immunology, vascular, uh, uh, imaging. And it's really very important. Uh, and, and they're all scientifically vetted, too. Uh, I'll tell you the, the uh, study sections. Look at the grants and find out which ones are scientifically sound and most likely to help multiple sclerosis. So they, their only access to find the, the, the cure or prevention of multiple sclerosis we're not promoting one specific thing, which I think is very, very dangerous. This is like saying, well, for a society or organization to say, we're just looking at one thing. And in my opinion, this is like saying, the Enron stock is so good, you cannot lose money. I'll put all my life savings in it. I'm going to make a fortune. Um, the MS Society, to its balance, is a diversified portfolio. Um, I would ask you to support the MS Society in any way you can, uh, financially, uh, with your time, uh, with your uh, volunteering. Um, again, just my opinion, I'm speaking for myself, uh, not the society or, or the university, but I think the MS Society is the one indispensable organization, uh, along with things like the NIH, that are really supporting uh, good research here. And I thought I would never have to say this, but it is true even today but sometimes the society itself has to be defended. Um, there have been some, I think, unfair uh, criticisms 
uh, there's been attempts to, to splinter and uh, to water down its role. Uh, again, just my opinion, but I think that's counterproductive. This is not an inspirational person, this is me. Um, from 1994 to 2001, I was a member of the study section B. It's one of the committees at the National that evaluates grants and decides which grants to give out. Um, and my wife's sister lives in New York, so I go stay with them. And my niece drew this picture here. Um, twice a year we got free trips to New York to review grants. I wish I could have gotten a picture. She drew another one of me holding 20 grants under each arm. It's kind of interesting to see that that's the way that a six-year-old thinks about you. <laughs> but here is someone who truly is inspiring. This is a picture of Peter Doherty, who uh, was on that committee at the same time I was there. Was there for six years, chair for three. Um, Peter's early work was uh, in Australia. In the 1970s, really uh, kind of unknown immunologist working there. Uh, there was a lack of lab space, and so the head of the lab threw him together with a graduate student named Rolf Zingernagel. Uh, it turns out their expertise complemented each other in their thinking. They did some experiments. They were working on viral infection, obscure viral infection in mice, and they happened, they were lucky, they had the right kind of groups of mice together, and they mixed and matched cells from the mice, and the results they got were in conflict with the prevailing immunological theory. And basically, they were clever enough to figure out that the prevailing theory was wrong. And they had the, the, the data to really back that up. They were initially uh, resisted for a long time, and now it's been accepted. Basically, what they did was to fundamentally show how T cells work, how T cells see things. And T cells are thought to be the quarterback or the mastermind of the immune system by many people. So basically, if you if you had to look at one person and kind of figure out what's going to go on this weekend, you'd look at Aaron Rodgers, wouldn't you? Or perhaps Brett Favre. Um, but it's the, the, the quarterback is really important to understand that. You to understand a lot about the immune system. Um, and eventually this became important for all of immunology, including, well, it started transplant immunology, but including the immunological basis of multiple sclerosis. And it's the underpinning of, of many of the therapies we have now came from this work. As I said, uh, Peter studied on, uh, was in the study section where we evaluated grants. And then in 1996, the announcement came that he won the Nobel Prize. The, the chair of the MSS, I think it's General Dugan then, came down and had the picture taken with the study section, all that. The only time he ever did that. Um, and I'd say that Peter is an incredibly kind and, and, and polite and humble person. The, the proceedings of that committee are, are confidential, of course, because you're citing money. Uh, in, in, it's important. But I remember once when there was a grant, this is a new assistant prop, so their career depends on this. You fund this grant, they're in, they don't, they're out. Uh, if you fund that grant, you can't fund another grant. And Peter and the other reviewer, there's two primary reviewers, had a huge difference of opinion about this grant, diametrically opposed. And Peter said, well, maybe you're right. I'll study this grant over the lunch hour, and come back, and maybe I'll change. And he changed what he did. Here was a guy who was a Nobel laureate, who was a real science superstar, who could have out-argued anybody on that committee and held sway. And yet he said, I could be wrong and went over things. Um, so what I want to say is, you should be glad that there are people uh, like Peter Doherty who donate their time for free, volunteer, to help promote multiple sclerosis. He's intensely interested uh, in, in the cause of multiple sclerosis and doing what science can do. Um, I'm often asked, just in conclusion here, uh, well, where's the next breakthrough? What's going to happen? Of course, if, if it's a breakthrough, we don't know. It's unanticipated. <laughs> uh, my son said, uh, if we knew what we're doing, it wouldn't be research, would it? <laughs> but my guess, my guess is the breakthrough will probably come from a, a young Peter Doherty somewhere, perhaps with a, a junior faculty award from the MS Society, uh, or maybe a Petra Doherty, because we have more female medical students and, and women in science now than men, actually, at the UW anyway. And the, the idea that will come up will be unconventional, maybe revolutionary, so change things, maybe explain all of autoimmunity, but it will be pursued by conventional means. That is to say, just like Peter Doherty and Ralph Zinkernagel, they had the data to back it up, they presented it in scientific journals, other people could replicate the results, and it and turned out to be true. This should give us hope that the fight against multiple sclerosis will be won, and hopefully uh, very soon. 
I want to thank you for your attention and for your support of the MS Society. Thank you very much.